Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Career Cert today and the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center for our webinar on multiple trauma in the older patient. I'm your host for the webinar, Danielle. At Career Cert, we are focused on providing emergency and healthcare professionals with the training they need to best protect and care for those in their communities. And we are grateful for this opportunity to connect with you today. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters for this webinar. Maria Box, Kenny Navarro, Paul Rosenberger, and Gil Salazar. Dr. Maria Box is a first year emergency medicine resident at UT Southwestern Medical Center, performing her clinical duties at UT Clements Hospital, Parkland Hospital, and Children's Medical Center in Dallas. She plans to continue to develop her strong interest in EMS and pre-hospital medicine throughout her time in residency. Kenny Navarro serves as Chief of EMS Education Development in the Department of Emergency Medicine at University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. Kenny also serves as a content consultant for various project teams at the American Heart Association. Kenny is a medical and education volunteer who specializes in teaching basic and advanced resuscitation courses in developing countries around the world. Dr. Paul Rosenberger has over 30 years of EMS experience with over 20 years of adult education instruction. Currently, Dr. Rosenberger is the Associate Director of the EMS Continuing Education Program at UT Southwestern and an adjunct faculty member for the Emergency Services Administration Program at the University of North Texas, Dallas. Dr. Gail Salazar serves as the Medical Director of EMS Education at UT Southwestern and serves both initial and continuing education of area EMS professionals. He practices clinically at Parkland Hospital Emergency Department. Dr. Salazar is dually board certified in emergency medicine and EMS and serves as core faculty for the emergency medicine residency and the EMS fellowship programs of UT Southwestern Medical Center. And now I will turn the time over to our presenters. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning for many of you. Uh, good afternoon for, for many uh, of you as well. We are grateful once again to Career Cert for the opportunity to bring uh, innovative uh, education to the table. Um, we at UT Southwestern are committed to the advancement of pre-health uh, and pre-hospital education all around the world. And today is going to be uh, the pre-hospital arena that we're going to be dealing with. I'm also very grateful for um, uh, you guys giving us some grace. Um, the ice storm here in DFW really kicked our behinds and we had to reschedule it. It's not like us and we're really grateful for the opportunity to reschedule it. It's going to be a packed hour today with lots of information. After we got done with the uh, practice uh, run, we were realizing just how much content there is in this one. Uh, and that's in a, in a really good way. Uh, we're bringing to the table a little bit of a different perspectives from kind of the hospital perspective, to the, from the pre-hospital perspective, and then kind of as a, an overall from an administrator's uh, perspective. The case today is um, uh, near and dear to me. I think uh, the care of the older patient, and that is a new term that is being used. Uh, we no longer use elderly, for example. We use older uh, patients. They present some particular challenges when it comes to their management and care, especially in polytrauma. And so we we hope that you find this case uh, educational um, and fruitful. Uh, I'll be answering questions uh, within the chat, so drop them in there if you need anything. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll I'll walk you through uh, kind of what we know so far, and and we'll go from there. This patient pertains to a, a, a very pleasant 73-year-old um, gentleman. Um, some significant past medical history included diabetes uh, and hypertension on no medications uh, that were of note. He was involved in a pretty significant motor vehicle collision on a, on a feeder. Um, don't know exactly what happened. The thought is probably struck uh, a barrier, may have fallen asleep, um, but the point is he uh, was found 30 uh, feet away from, from his cars, from, from his vehicle, on the side of the road, bystanders called uh, 911. Um, and when uh, EMT and paramedics got there, they were asking the patient quite a few questions as, as is customary, but uh, the patient really had 
really no recollection of kind of what happened, didn't really know if he had passed out, and um, the patient didn't know how he had gotten uh, from his vehicle to the 30 feet, probably did not crawl there, may have probably, was probably ejected. Um, the medics certainly documented that he had a GCS of 15 at the time, and uh, the documented findings of, uh, of significance uh, was that he had a very, very prominent uh, scalp laceration with active bleeding, and he was complaining of thigh pain with an obvious deformity. So uh, obviously a very complex scene on patients who can be medically complex. And now when you're dealing with polytrauma, uh, it makes it even more, more difficult. So I wanna, wanna pick on my friend uh, and mentor, Kenny, who um, has been a, a field paramedic for many years and now is now a, an elite educator with us. So Kenny, you're going up on this scene, like what's going through through your head in terms of managing this gentleman? So in terms of management, um... You know, I, I would say that for obviously first you've got to do some type of an assessment to get some clear idea if there's anything life-threatening that you need to deal with right away. Um, you know, from here, from the information presented on the screen, you, you, you know, we, we probably want to make the worst case assumptions. And so uh, my worst case assumption is that he was thrown this 30 feet um, as opposed to, um, you know, getting up and, and crawling or something like that. So, so worst case scenarios, we have, uh, you know, uh, probably a high speed impact if it's thrown him this far. Um, we have uh, GCS of 15, which is which is pretty good, but there's active bleeding from a large scalp wound that we're going to, and and then a potentially fractured femur. So I think that that we're going to have to focus on probably, you know, some um, ble uh, bleeding control issues and then maybe um, do some very quick assessment on airway and, and respiratory threats before we move into any kind of detailed um, examination. Absolutely. So, so, you know, I think uh, that EMS has been, you know, since the beginning, um, has been taught the ABCDE approach to patient assessment, and that's worked well with us uh, for us for a long period of time. But the military is actually, uh, you know, they, they have uh, come up with a different type of assessment technique. So they use a MARCH assessment where the M would stand for uh, massive hemorrhage, then there's airway management, then respiration and breathing, then circulation, and head injury and hypothermia assessment and prevention. So I think that it follows fairly closely, and I think it's probably a good idea to supplement, you know, the traditional ABCD approach that we might use in all of our medical calls with some type of a march um, prioritization when we're dealing with uh, trauma patients. I so, definitely like that idea, Kenny, for sure. And then on top of that, throw in the fact that elder patients, their mental baseline may not be uh, normal. And, you know, 73 is not exactly what I would refer to as, as very, very elderly, but um, my 72-year-old father-in-law has already developed uh, dementia at, at that age. So that's also a consideration for, for us in EMS, especially when you have a patient with uh, unknown loss of consciousness or has really no recollection of, of what happened. Definitely, definitely love the March uh, assessment. So next slide, Paul, please. So just like Kenny was kind of alluding to, first things first, we got to look at our vital signs. Um, and in this case, we will do our primary assessment with our ABCDEs. Um, vital signs wise on first glance, nothing really pops out at you. You can think, well, for a healthy person, this doesn't look too alarming. However, we are talking about a 72 year old gentleman. And so there are some other things that we have to take into consideration here. Um, so that blood pressure initially should definitely jump out at you in a person who's of that age, um, as well as that pulse. Um, so those two things can kind of tip you off to say, okay, something's wrong here, something else is going on. With a respiratory rate of 22, um, it clues you in that he could be compensating for a perfusion deficit, um, and then that temperature is clearly hypothermic, and that not only gives us an issue here in the field, but also can present issues once he gets to the hospital and later on down the line. Um, as far as our ABCDs, he gets to the hospital or he gets to, to the ambulance and he his airway is intact, he's able to talk to you. 
um, kind of moaning and groaning in pain so you know that he's uncomfortable. You stick on that seat collar um, and then he's got good breath sounds and good pulses. Um, you calculate that GCS, just GCS of 15 um, and then we expose our patients. Um, with this primary survey being complete, I'd kind of like to ask Kenny again, sorry to pick on you, um, but are there any new formats for our medics as far as documenting um, primary survey? So, so the March method, of course, is, is, uh, can, be, can supplement this. You can see that there's some parts of this that are the same, right? The, uh, the A and the R and the C are really the same as the ABC. So we're just really, um, you know, and there was a time even with the ABC where, where when you got to that C, it was, uh, you know, checking for signs of circulation and correcting. I can remember that it was taught that it was also the time that you would correct any uh, massive hemorrhages that were occurring or active bleeding. And so the military model, the march, really just uh, sort of moves the hemorrhage up to the to the very beginning, so that if that's you know if you arrive on the scene, you're looking at someone with an amputation, right? That um, you know the limb is is off and they're bleeding profusely. That you're going to have to get control of that. One of the one of the bad things I suppose about uh, mnemonics and algorithms is they assume a linear approach. And of course, in the field, it's not just like it is in the emergency department. It's rarely, there's rarely going to be a situation where you're all by yourself and you have to move in a linear fashion. Uh, more often than not, you're going to have a group of people and the group of people can do multiple things at, at the same time. So bleeding control and airway management uh, can all occur at the same time. So I think that you have that. One of the other things that I wanted to mention is a couple of points is that, um, and, and you've alluded to this as well, that um, if, I mean, I, I would, on any given day, I would be happy to have those vital signs for myself. Uh, but um, for a 73 year old, you have to keep things into context. So when you're doing these assessments, you have to keep it in the context of, of the patient that you're dealing with and even your assessment findings. Now, the other point that I wanted to make was the temperature. And so I just want to remind everyone that you don't have to have a really cold day in order to have hypothermic patients. I mean, if you think about on, on, on any multi-systems trauma patient where medics are going to be removing clothing, and um, then you might have a patient that's exposed to the uh, outside environment, e even on a relatively warm day, if you don't have any clothes on and you're covered in um, blood or other liquids, um, that, that um, you can have evaporation pretty easily and temperatures can fall. And the impact of hypothermia on trauma patients doesn't require temperatures to drop to this level. You can just lose one or two degrees and it's going to make a difference. Kenny, and that uh, linearity in um, looking at vital signs and taking them at phase value can, can really get you in trouble both in EMS and really at the hospital level. So you're absolutely right. That is a very concerning set of vital signs. Now, um, assuming we've done a, a proper assessment and we've begun the process of getting this, this patient packaged up, I wanna pick on my friend Paul and, and discuss some of the nuances specifically. How do you, what's your approach to packaging this specific patient with the uh, knowledge that we may have a, a femur deformity clinically. I want to pick, pick on you, Paul. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, when you um, talk about uh, spinal motion restriction, um, that's all changing. And, and, and quite honestly, maybe it's all changed at this particular moment. But uh, in, in 2018, um, the National Association of EMS Physicians um, issued a position statement, and that was issued with uh, American College of Surgeons and the American College of Emergency Physicians. And so they, they wanted to develop a consensus so that we all had some direction as to how we should be managing patients um, when it comes to spinal motion restriction. And when you read through this uh, position statement, it really kind of has three categories of patients who should be um, uh, immobilized in some capacity. And so, um, you know, um, I'm a very simplistic person. And so my three, the way I have it in my head, the three things are, um, number one, if you can obtain a good history or do a uh, adequate assessment 
Um, this is time to apply spinal motion restriction precautions. So this is one of them. And to give you examples of what I'm saying here is um, one would be, for instance, a patient with an altered mental status. Um, you're, you're not going to get a really good history or an assessment with them. Um, you have a patient who is intoxicated. Um, again, you probably can't do a really good assessment or history. Or you have a patient who has a communication barrier of some sort where you're just unable to communicate with them. So that's the first category is unable to obtain a history or perform an adequate assessment. The second one, um, which we're all familiar with, is actually having a finding of some sort. So perhaps the patient tells you their back or their neck hurts. Um, maybe as you do your assessments, you actually have a neurological finding. So there's numbness or tingling or burning in the extremities or you actually see some type of deformity along the spine. And so again, that's number two. So you actually have a finding of some sort. And then number three um, is you have a distracting type injury, meaning that there's an injury that would cause a lot of pain, a lot of distraction and the patient um, would not necessarily feel the, uh, the spinal injury as a result of that distracting injury. And so um, this gentleman here, in this case, has a femur fracture um, that would certainly qualify as a distracting injury. And so with that said, I think that this patient is going to require spinal motion restriction uh, based on, on the uh, NAMSP uh, criteria. And then I guess the other thing I would mention here is age. Um, some protocols um, do require that patients are immobilized when they're really young or, or really old. Um, but that is not part of the NAMSP uh, position statement. They do uh, specifically address pediatrics. And uh, they say that um, if the the child is not a good historian or you can't perform a good assessment, then then perhaps a spinal motion restriction should be considered. And again, um, you know, this is this is criteria coming from, you know, three big national um, medical director type organizations. And so um, you should follow your protocol and do whatever it is that your medical direction asks you to do. But uh, just to kind of recap here, um, if you can't get a history or do a good assessment, um, you're unable um, to uh, communicate with that patient, you actually have a finding or you have distracting type injuries, those patients should, should really be um, immobilized in some capacity. And the position statement also talks about how we do that. And uh, there's lots of ways. I mean, you can use the scoop stretcher, um, you can use the traditional backboard, vacuum splints, um, just whatever it takes to do the, the cot itself. Um, but uh, Again, the, the goal here is to mobilize the entire spine if you're going to do SMR. Definitely the, uh, the game has changed quite a bit in terms of um, uh, spinal immobilization for, for patients. And in my own practice, pre-hospital and in the hospital, I've completely switched um, how I, I do this. I'm a lot less aggressive now. You know, I think putting somebody in a backboard unless absolutely necessary is, is cruel. Um, and can lead to problems down the line. I actually really like the um, the sandbag products available. I don't want to name uh, any by name uh, to avoid any conflict of interest, but those uh, that can form around the patient and easily uh, help you transport the patient from the scene to your ambulance and then to the hospital are absolutely great. So, um, you know, in EMS, we don't always have the luxury of doing a kind of a full secondary survey on people and kind of make decisions on immobilization based on a secondary survey. We got to do it fairly quickly. So let's uh, see what the secondary uh, survey shows on the next slide, Paul, and, and we can start taking a look at uh, some decisions on how to better immobilize this patient. So EMS is able to nicely package up our patient and deliver him to the hospital. Um, on arrival, we start completing our secondary survey. Um, GCS is still 15 at the time, but on his head, like we've kind of mentioned before, you see this large avulsion um, with a pulsatile bleeding that makes you really concerned for some arterial bleeding. Um, a pressure dressing has been applied, um, and the pupils are equal, round, and reactive. Um, there's some blood in the nares, but no septal hematoma. And then our airway is clear, maybe some scant blood, um, but nothing that's impeding his ability to breathe. Um, otherwise, our lungs and our heart sounds clear and our belly is benign, but on the extremities, um, you've got some abrasions and lacerations, both the upper and lower extremity. But what's most concerning to you is that right lower extremity with that obvious femur deformity. 
Um, and here we're going to launch our first poll. Um, would you place a traction splint on this patient? As um, as you, the practice for traction splints, you know, it's a it's a time honored uh, tradition. I guarantee you. Uh, Kenny and Paul and myself grew up um, putting traction splints and could put it on in our sleep. Now, I think uh, the overwhelming majority of our young EMS professionals out there may be familiar with it, but we just don't use it anymore. So I kind of want to see where everybody falls on uh, on this uh, traction splint question. Um, I think the ball game has, has changed for me. There's quite a bit of a yes, a little bit of no. And actually, I think this reflects the yeah, the current trend in um, in traction splints. And we're going to discuss a little bit about traction splints in the next uh, couple of slides. So thank you for for indulging me. Let's uh, move on with uh, with the presentation. So moving on, we know by our vitals that our patient has some degree of shock. Uh, we do think it's compensated at this time. Um, we've identified two sources so far, both our scalp bleed and our obvious femur deformity um, as potential sources. Specifically talking about hemorrhage control for this scalp wound, um, as I mentioned, he came in with a uh, dresser, uh, pressure dressing applied, um, and that's definitely appropriate. Um, but I think we should also have a pretty low threshold for moving on to the next level, the next level being combat gauze which is a coagulopathic dressing that helps with hemostasis. Um, and so I think that that should be something definitely on the forefront of our mind if our pressure dressing isn't quite doing the job. Um, I'm gonna send it over to Dr. Salazar to talk about other places that our patient could be bleeding from, um, but we should definitely keep this scalp in mind. I am here to tell you that I have seen patients develop hemorrhagic shock from an isolated scalp wound. Now, the medics did a phenomenal job of getting hemostasis uh, with a pressure dressing on the scalp, and yet we still noticed um, a downtrend in vital signs, which we will show you shortly. Um, so in my mind, when I see these types of hemodynamics, I start worrying about uh, compensated and then decompensated shock. So just to remind our, our listeners or viewers, out there, some of the places where you really got to consider where hemorrhage is, is coming from. External, I think everybody can recognize it, and tourniquets are a, a long standing tradition and they are absolutely life saving. But these are some of the spots where, uh, especially us in EMS, can often not have the benefit of, of looking. Um, the thoracic cavity, large um, hemothoraces, uh, and some of them can be pneumohemothoraces. You can lose a large proportion of your uh, circulating volume in the thorax. Don't forget about the peritoneal cavity. Everybody talks about internal bleeding, internal hemorrhage. That peritoneal cavity is also uh, a place for your solid organs to bleed into and, and kill you. The retroperitoneal space, uh, particularly where your aorta sits, and also consider places like your pelvis where you can have very minimal to no findings whatsoever. You may have a patient with some pain, maybe some urinary types of symptoms, and that may be the only thing that you have to cue you in that this hemodynamically unstable patient has a uh, life-threatening hemorrhage. In femur fractures too, um, we can see that this patient with a right uh, femur fracture, that compartment in the thigh can hold quite a bit of volume as well. So in EMS, start thinking about not just external, the things you can take care of, right off the bat, well, where else can the patient be, be bleeding from? So what do we do about it? That's the main thing. Um, Kenny, I want to get your thoughts on um, on a, a new trend. Uh, it's been around for a while, but it's gaining more acceptance, and that is blood products and, and EMS. So I want to kind of pick your brain about what you think about blood. So, uh, um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the use of blood products actually is not a new thing, as you say. And in emergency medicine and field medicine, you know, even before uh, the Second World War, people were looking at field administration of, of blood products. Um, but then, you know, with, um, you know, in World War II, that sort of, people started losing some interest in that and started looking at crystalloid, uh, flu, you know, fluids uh, in the emergency, that, that, that sort of EMS type setting, even though EMS didn't really exist. And so, you know, recently, more recently, people have gone back to looking at 
uh, some of the blood product um, data and some of the questions about its applicability. And certainly, uh, I think that in the history, if you look back in the history of EMS, there's a lot that changes because of war, uh, things that we learn in the military. So um, when you look at trying to adapt blood administration in a civilian set setting, and you're using um, military data, you have to keep in mind that the patients that are injured in wartime or in those types of events are usually young young males, and they've suffered you know, blast injuries or high velocity penetrating trauma, and they don't have hypertension, and they don't have cardiovascular disease, and type two diabetes, and all of the other comorbidities that go along with it that you'd see in a civilian population. So we have to be careful about taking that information now and, and adapting it. Now, having said that, there's really two issues that I think are important when you start looking at whether EMS should be using blood products or not. One is the logistics of even being able to carry it in the first place. And then you look at the clinic, at the, if there's any clinical benefit to the patients, you know, overall. And I think that the logistical things are a significant hurdle. I mean, if you look at the resources that might be necessary to devote to carrying blood products in an urban area, then you would have to weigh the cost of those benefits to any potential uh, advantage when trauma centers are easily available. So like in our system in Dallas, where you have trauma centers that are easily accessible, um, you know, you have to wonder whether there would be a benefit or not. So when you look at the research, the research certainly shows that it is feasible for EMS to be carrying these products um, as long as you have a you know pretty robust uh, support system. Uh, but the real question, I think, is whether there's clinical advantage to that. Now, um, when you look at the different types of blood products that's out there, you've got, you know, things like plasma, you got packed red blood cells, and then you have whole blood. So if you look at maybe why someone would want to have more than the other or, or, or use one over the other, well, certainly the plasma would be there for patients who need volume, um, but they don't have any oxygen carrying capacity. Then you look at packed red cells where there's oxygen carrying capacity, but um, that it's not as much of a volume expander as, as, the, as the, um, the plasma might be. So in whole blood, I think you get the best of both worlds. But again, each one of them comes with their own logistical challenges. So um, I think the research is still lacking to support the use of whole blood in most ground-based systems. Um, there may be some, some evidence of some benefits for some injuries in uh, air medical units, but I'm not sure that, uh, the, uh, that the, the research is clear on this yet. Yeah, the logistical challenges alone of of uh, keeping whole blood um, kind of stored and, uh, and and ready to rock and roll for a ground service may be prohibitive. Um, but we got to remember the degree of coagulop coagulopathy of um, clotting, uh, loss of clotting capability in these patients and hemorrhagic shock half can be so profound that really one of the only things that is going to help them is one source control at the hospital two. Uh, replenishment of the packed red blood cells and the clotting factors, uh, which brings me to tranexamic acid, um, which has gained quite a bit of attention. You know, that medication has been around for a while, but it's made its uh, way into emergency medicine and EMS um, as of the last five to seven, maybe 10 years to some degree, but within the last five to seven years, we've seen the rise of TXA using, uh, being used in many clinical guidelines around the world for the management of um, a hemorrhagic shock in patients uh, coming by EMS. So for those agencies that um, have never kind of dived into the, the business of whole blood, haven't thought about it, or uh, even TXA, maybe it's it's um, time to do so. So um, let's uh, launch the next poll, uh, Danielle, and I wanna see what our uh, viewers out there would do. What if you have a, patient, you don't have good adequate control of, say, a scalp uh, injury or perhaps a other type of injury, what do you have available to you um, uh, as far as other treatments that you would consider? 
Now, we can either be realistic about what you actually have, or do you have a preference in terms of uh, would you rather have whole blood or or TXA? I just kind of want to pick your your brains a little bit. I'll tell you that some of our services, um, particularly flight, are going to carry both uh, active blood products and um, and TXA. And the clinical guideline is uh, pretty prescriptive so that the medics have a, a good solid idea of when to deploy that um, that treatment. So let's see where everybody everybody sits in terms of crystalloid, some blood products and and TXA. So yeah, it sounds like this is a very progressive um, type of crowd, and i'm I'm really happy happy to see that. So, uh, just to recap that conversation, I think whole blood is going to be have to enter the conversation in patients with hemorrhagic shock pre-hospital, uh, and if that is prohibited, then TXA is going to be um, the way to go as well. Uh, next slide, please. If I could just add one thing about TXA, uh, and that is that I think, in, again, in the history of EMS, we always look for the magic bullets. Um, you know, we look for those in cardiac arrest and, you, you, you know, we think that things like double sequential defibrillation is going to make all the big difference. And just over the years, we've seen so many things come and go, mass trousers and, you know, the, all of these special um, tools. Um, I think if, I think that uh, TXA has its place. It's cheap. The side effects are really minimal. And so, uh, I, you know, I don't have any major heartburns about adding TXA to anyone's uh, armament in the field. But I think if you're looking at TXA to make a huge difference in outcomes for trauma patients in a in a, a system that has a mature response to trauma, like in an urban area with lots of access to trauma centers, I'm just not sure that uh, that that's there. When you look at the studies that are out there, most of those big crash studies were done in low resource settings where you didn't have a mature EMS system or even a mature um, trauma response system. And so th those uh, those benefits might have come from the fact that they were being used in a low resource center. So th those are my thoughts. Thank you, Kenny. Um, hemorrhagic shock remains one of the most um, concerning killers for us who work in the pre-hospital uh, arena. So let's do a brief recap, Paul, on, uh, on hemorrhagic shock and how uh, that might look for a patient our age, not our age personally, but the patient's age. Yeah, okay. So, so this table uh, comes from the Emergency Medicine Journal. Um, typically when I see tables like this, my eyes glaze over and I go, oh my goodness. Um, but there are some really good nuggets in this thing. And so let's just kind of break this down and make this a little bit more simplistic to see. So if, uh, if I could redraw this table, and this was Paul's table, um, stage one would actually be labeled um, early shock. Stage two would be uh, labeled as advanced shock or mid-stage shock. And clearly stage three, stage four would be considered late shock. And so um, I would break this table into three different uh, stages, early, uh, advanced, and, and then uh, ultimately late. Um, and then when you come down the other column here, we look at um, three things I think are really critical that we see as, as EMS providers. And uh, for me, one of my biggest assessments is always going to be that mental state. So that would be number one. Um, the next thing I would look at is this pulse rate. And then thirdly, um, the respiratory rate. Not saying that blood pressure is not important, but I think we all know that when the blood pressure drops, we have hypotension. And so, um, and that is always certainly a, a late finding with, with uh, hemorrhagic shock. And so to me, I think our focus should, needs to be the mental state, um, the pulse rate, and the respiratory rate. So, so to back up a little bit here, um, so this uh, stage one or this early shock, um, what we see here is pretty much everything looks pretty normal with the exception that the patient may be slightly anxious. And if you look at the, the percentage of blood loss there, we're talking 15%. So that patient can lose um, less than 15% of their blood. And the only sign or symptom that we see is uh, some anxiousness. And, and that is very slight anxiousness that we see in this early shock. Um, we move on to this advanced shock or this mid-stage. So now we're in this uh, blood loss somewhere between 15 and 30%. 
Um, if you look at the mental state here, um, we have some mild anxiety. Um, the respiratory rate um, is a little bit of a clue here because uh, 12 to 20 would be normal. In this case, we're seeing respiratory rates uh, 20 to 30. And at this stage here, we're now just beginning to see a tachycardia. And so that is a, is a slight tachycardia. It's a tachycardia somewhere between 100 um, and, and somewhere in that range up to 120-ish. And so it, when you go back and look at this case here, I believe this gentleman's um, heart rate was uh, 101. And, um, you know, his blood pressure was slightly decreasing because he did have a history of hypertension. And I believe his blood pressure was like 115 over 70-ish. Um, and so this, this has given us a clue that this patient is in pretty advanced shock at this particular moment. And uh, the only thing we're really seeing is, you know, um, a, a faster heart rate and a respiratory rate that's a little bit increased. We then move over to the, um, the late stages, stage three and four here. And um, now you've got confusion and lethargy. And so I think we can all recognize that as shock. And if you look at the respiratory rate here, this is greater than, than 30. So this is a, a tachypnea. And the heart rate is certainly responding as well. So the heart rate is in stage three greater than 120, stage four greater than 140. But um, you know, this table isn't nearly as complicated when you break it down and do early uh, advanced shock and late shock. And you clue in on those mental status, the uh, pulse rate and the respiratory rate. And the earliest signs and symptoms of shock is going to be the pulse rate and the respiratory rate. And some point later, the, the blood pressure will start to diminish and uh, we need to be way ahead of the blood pressure dropping. And so again, focusing in on anxiety and, and respiration rates and, and pulse rates is critical for us to, to, uh, to pick up on shock very early in our care. The, um, one of the things that concerned me about this patient was that decreased level of consciousness, some confusion, no matter what the medical history is, that's always gonna be concerning to me. You know, as we, aim to be more progressive in how we do these ball. And yeah, my eyes always glaze over just like you when I look at this table and I just kind of think to myself, what are the things that uh, I need to be remembering? Now, Dr. Box, are there any methods that we could look at in the pre-hospital arena to better assess the degree of hemorrhagic shock in patients? Yeah, there there definitely are. Um, the the main one that comes to mind just working in the, in the ER and the trauma bay is our point of care ultrasound, which I realize might not be as easily accessible and as feasible um, for those of y'all um, on an ambulance. But actually, it's really easy in the Bay if you can, you know, ever get your hands on it or, or have someone show you. I think it's really worthwhile. Um, so you can just get a, like a, a portable ultrasound machine, um, and it's a really easy view to obtain. You just get the mid sagittal view. Um, in the med epigastric region, and you can see the inf inferior vena cava super easily, um, right as it comes off the heart and it starts passing by the liver, gives off the hepatic vein. And just by looking at it by the size and also the compliance of it, um, you can tell volume status very easily and also, um, you know, to a more sensitive degree than just the vital signs alone. Um, so usually what we use is just looking at the collapsibility with each each respiration. If it collapses more than 50 percent, meaning that it's super compressible and you see it really narrow, you know that your patient is volume down and could use some fluid and is probably in a in a pretty serious state of shock. Um, and then on the flip side of that, if it's really huge and plethoric and just kind of gorging, um, you can kind of tell that your patient might not benefit from some fluids. Um, they might be fluid overloaded. A lot of the times you see that in your CH, CHF patients um, and you it's a really quick way to just assess volume status. And I think that's super important, you know, in these cases, especially with our older adults, because um, our hemodynamics at that age are just super blunted, not only because of their age, but also, you know, they have multiple com comorbidities that are kind of affecting their hemodynamics. Um, and also their compensatory mechanisms to deal with insults like our patient has dealt with today. Um, but then also just polypharmacy. I think since like 1990s, I think I saw a stat that says since the 1990s, the number or the percentage of older adults who are on five or more medications has tripled. Um, so you just have so many effects between beta blockers and, 
you know, all their other different hypertension medications, and some of them are on blood pressure raising medications. Um, so it's really harder in, in this subset of patients to pick apart their hemodynamics and their vitals. So here's a plug for modern EMS professionals, us as leaders, and then some of our students who may be joining us today, a quick point of care ultrasound looking at the patients. If you're a vena cava, can pretty much supplement uh, or even take over a lot of these tables and give us a fast idea about what the patient's volume status is. Let's go to the next uh, slide, Paul. I'd love to discuss um, a few more of the patient's injuries. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Box, um, you mentioned some of the comorbidities and the medications, the polypharmacy issues. Um, what about some of these new um, anticoagulants that these patients are taking for like atrial fib or pulmonary emboli or DVTs or heart valve replacement? How does that impact our, our care and our assessments? Sure. I think that's a great point, especially in these trauma patients. Um, and I think you know, as time goes on, you're going to be pretty hard pressed to find, you know, an older adult in the 70 age range um, who isn't on some of these anticoagulants, um, whether it be for, like you were mentioning, PEs or DVTs or, or what have you. Um, you know, you have your more common ones like warfarin. Um, some are on like anoxaparin, apixaban, and then you have your really fancy ones like bondaparinu, um, that you know, you just want to be aware of what medications your patient is on because um, any kind of trauma in the in the older adult population is dangerous, but especially if, if they're on these oral or any type of anticoagulants. Um, obviously, your risk of bleeding is a lot higher um, and then, it, you know, it could alter your hemodynamics and, and, you know, just create all kinds of confusion and sort of a mess. So I think knowing your patient's medication list is of high importance. Yeah, and I, and I think you're right. I think, um, you know, when we look at these medications, you know, sometimes we can figure out that perhaps they are taking these medications when we get that history. When that patient says, oh, I have a history of, of pulmonary emboli or, or atrial fib, we should start anticipating that uh, perhaps these patients are taking one of these medications and it could complicate the case um, when it comes to bleeding. And it's been studied um, uh, in EMS before. You know, the, uh, the care of the older adults on uh, anticoagulants um, is is significant, and we've shown time and time again morbidity and mortality is up when these older adults suffer trauma and they're uh, on anticoagulants, driving the uh, trauma activation criteria in many regions, including ours. All right, Paul, let's go on to the next one here. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on uh, pathophysiology of femur fractures. What I really wanted to focus on is um, we know that these fractures can lead to significant hemodynamic collapse. Um, and so what are the things that we can do in EMS to, to address um, these things? Remember that it's not just a hem um, hemorrhagic shock type deal. These patients can also suffer um, neurological injuries, absolutely devastating neurological injuries um, as well. And that can happen rather quickly when you don't have an adequate blood supply or you have a, a nerve injury. And so we in EMS owe it to these patients to recognize these injuries and, and treat them. One of the biggest uh, drivers of morbidity and mortality on these patients is the development of compartment syndrome. This doesn't happen very often in the thigh compartment, but I have seen it seen it happen with a femur fracture. They happen more often with the tibia or fibula fractures, and they can be absolutely devastating to soft tissue, muscle, and the only way to help these individuals is by performing uh, surgery on them. So I want to pick on my, my colleagues a little bit and kind of get back to the, um, the traction splints. I'll give you my my take on it and then um, feel free to kind of pitch in. Uh, Kenny, I'll, I'll shoot it to you. It's my humble opinion that the old school application of, of traction splints is time consuming. It's often done on patients whose pain is not adequately controlled and it more than likely leads to um, prolonged transport, um, to get the patient to a trauma center in the hospital where, where we can get um, hemorrhage control. So in, in my humble opinion, 
probably less is more when it comes to, to these fractures, fully, fully knowing that the morbidity and mortality from these uh, injuries is quite significant. So I want to get your thoughts, Kenny, on where you sit on that uh, conversation. Yeah, so I think, again, you know, back when Paul and I went to paramedic school in the 70s or 80s or so, this was, uh, these were pretty standard. Uh, I can remember even in our state, it was required equipment on an ambulance up until maybe five years ago, you were required by the state to carry traction splints. Um, but I think that um, for the reasons that you mentioned, it's time for traction splints to go into the museum. They can sit in there with uh, mass trousers and demand valves and uh, other ridiculous things. Uh, I, I, you know, if I'm if my femur is fractured, I want you to give me something for pain. And then once you adequately manage my pain, I don't really care what you do to me at that point. Um, but uh, don't put a put a traction splint on me until you manage my pain. And then uh, then once you do that, you know, a board splint or just put somebody on a backboard or a vacuum mattress, and um, th and that should be just fine. As long as you're not you know slinging the leg around. You know, trying to move the foot or things like that, then it's going to be uh, it's going to be okay. I think it's time for these to go away. And, and I have to tell you, Kenny, I love that because uh, you know I like being vulnerable. And um, you know, I, I had a, a call early in my career. Um, this is probably in the eighties, mid eighties, and uh, we had a, a a female driver who struck a tree unrestrained. She did the down and under path. And she ended up having a, a femur fracture. And unfortunately, I did take the time to place the uh, traction splint. Um, and, and since that particular call, I've always wished I could have gone back and redone that call because what I would have done is moved her to a backboard and mobilized her uh, quickly on the backboard um, and, and maybe perhaps a blanket between the legs and moved to a trauma center pretty rapidly because of you know just the mechanisms involved that would uh, actually fracture a femur in a young, young female adult. Um, you know, if I could do that over, I would, um, but I can't undo what I've done, but I certainly have learned from that. And uh, to me, the only in indication for a, a traction splint is an isolated uh, femur fracture where there is absolutely no other injuries involved. And time is not of an essence like it would be in this particular gentleman that's what, 71, 72 years old. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think I fully agree with you guys, I think the um, the conversation has really shifted toward a, a minimalistic approach to treatment of these. You know, really, what we wound up doing for this gentleman, as we'll see later, is actually we wound up putting a surgical traction, a pin, uh, right there in the emergency department. So definitely worthwhile having that conversation within your departments about really the uh, risk versus benefit analysis uh, on traction splints. It wouldn't be a UT Southwestern career cert um, uh, webinar if it wasn't for, you know, the story only gets gets better. So, Dr. Box, where do we go from here? Yeah, I mean, despite our best efforts in treatment, at re treatment and resuscitation at this level one trauma center, um, unfortunately, our patient does deteriorate. Uh, first thing you notice, getting a little bit more somnolent, somnolent needing a little bit more stimulation to interact. Um, DSATs into the 70s uh, just gets like super tachycardic and even more hypotensive than he was before. Um, Kenny, if you had this patient in the field or in transport to the hospital, uh, what, what would be your approach right now? So one of the things obviously that would be very concerning, anytime that you have a patient that is deteriorating despite you providing what you think is the appropriate therapy, is that you've missed an injury, that you've missed something that is continuing to take its toll. So, uh, you know, immediately some things that you would, that I would want to do would be uh, to get the patient, if I, if I don't already have them on high flow oxygen, to make sure that I get them on high flow oxygen first, but then I have to go to the source, start trying to look for what did I miss that is affecting this patient's oxygenation. Um, I, I do want to, do, do want to mention that, you know, once you, once pulse oximeters get to low readings, once you start getting into the low 80s and certainly into the 70s, their accuracy becomes uh, a lot less, uh, well, they become a lot less accurate. Uh, but having said that, um, you know, whether you have a patient that has a SpO2 of 70 or 65 or 75, you already know that your patient's in trouble. Once they get to that low zone, they're in trouble and the number really doesn't matter anymore. So, you know, one of the things that I would be thinking about would be um, 
perhaps uh, I've missed something in the thorax. You know, I focused on that leg, I focused on um, the, the scalp laceration, but maybe there was a blow to the to the uh, to the thorax, or maybe there's an airway issue now that I need to be dealing with. So I, I would have to go back to my uh, March assessments and uh, and reevaluate to see if I've missed something. I'm, yeah. You may even have to make a decision at the, at some point whether um, you know rapid sequence induction or endotracheal intubation becomes or some type of advanced airway maneuver in order to help this patient oxygenate. Yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Um, I was glad to hear you not jump straight to to rapid sequence intub intubation. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that in this patient that could, uh, you know, all those medications could take away his uh, sympathetic drive and could actually kill him. Um, so more than anything, you know, just like you said, what this patient needs is transport and massive transfusion protocol. Um, and then at the hospital, just careful airway management. And just like you said, we always got to keep asking ourselves, is there something that we missed? Is there something else that can be contributing to this picture? Mm -hmm. You mentioned one of the, the tenets of one of the ways that we can actually kill patients while trying to do some good for them is um, you mentioned if we induce this patient using our RSI uh, clinical guidelines, we take away their sympathetic drive that's helping them drive a little bit better cardiac output. We throw that down the down the street with um, induction, we could potentially kill patients. So I, I, I think that um, that bears uh, some reiteration. Let's be very, very careful about airway management, particularly in this patient population. You got an oxygenation deficit, you have a perfusion deficit, you may have a ventilation deficit, but that shouldn't drive us to take care of a ventilation deficit too aggressively. We got a massive, massive issue. So, you know, this is despite the some of the best care in the world, just world-class care, you know, a phenomenal EMS agency, a world-class trauma one level center, and this is how humbling these these patients can be. So let's uh, move on to the next slide, Paul, and, and start showing our friends uh, some of the injuries that we're dealing with. We yeah, know so, oh, go ahead. yeah, so just like um, we had mentioned, we always got to keep looking for other sources of, uh, of injury, something that we missed. So, um, you know, we get our imaging. Uh, a lot of it comes back normal, CT brain, so stone cold normal. Um, same thing with our abdomen, pelvis, and our, and our spine. But uh, interestingly enough, our CT chest does show this mediastinal hematoma. Um, and then also we have diffuse pulmonary contusion, uh, which could be one source of our, you know, decreasing uh, SpO2 and our increasing oxygen requirement. Um, as well as the fact that he did have pneumomediastinum and a left pneumothorax. Um, and then, of course, we get imaging of that femur because it's pretty obvious deformity, um, and it does show a fracture of this mid-femur. Absolutely devastating, devastating injuries um, that this patient can suffer. And so we, we began to see um exactly where this patient might actually be be hemorrhaging uh from so i want to let's show the image paul of the um of the ct on there and maria just go ahead and, and show them that if you if you don't mind you you've been doing such a phenomenal job so kind of walk our friends through what they're seeing there on that ct image sure sure um so you know it's always nice when they give you the good old arrow uh, to kind of help you out there. But this mediastinal hematoma, it's really an uncommon, but a really important source, um, a really important finding, I, I guess I should say, in blunt abdominal trauma to the chest, um, because it could be potentially fatal. Uh, a lot of the times it's caused by an aortic injury specifically, um, specifically an aortic transection, but also it can be mediastinal vascular injury or by fracture um, to the sternum or the vertebral column. Um, and it's so important not to miss just, you know, because all that fluid accumulating outside um, can put so much pressure on the heart that it can cause this extra pericardial cardiac tamponade. Um, and like I said before, can be can be super fatal and could be one of the sources of you know, they explain deterioration in hemodynamics in this patient. 
So, um, you know, some things to look for, unfortunately, the signs and symptoms are pretty widespread. So you got to keep it high on your differential, even though it's kind of a rarer thing to see. Um, but definitely looking for that seatbelt sign, steering wheel sign, any si signs of like um, ecchymosis or abrasions on the chest wall, um, as well as any new cardiac finding, anything while you're listening on auscultation, um, as well as something as I hate to say benign, but something as, or maybe something as common as chest pain or back pain um, or shortness of breath after a trauma where you don't really know exactly what went on. Um, same thing with like dysphagia um, and then, you know, hypertension just in the upper extremities, uh, similar to like, you know, aortic dissection, kind of a similar mechanism here. Um, so something to keep high on your radar, um, but all the while knowing that it's maybe a little bit less common. One uh, an additional consideration for these patients' injuries. Let's say that um, we had any suspicion of a pelvic fracture and route. You know, we we have a femur fracture, and oftentimes we confuse femur fractures with hip fractures. And if that sounds silly to you, um, it, it's out there. And so one of the considerations for uh, the modern EMS systems that are very progressive is going to be, should we start applying pelvic binders uh, in the field? Now, uh, some will say this patient has a contraindication for a pelvic binder in that he has a femur fracture. But uh, let me just kind of be very clear. If you have a patient in hemorrhagic shock without a clear source, especially in, in a mechanism um, of this um, of this gravity, then I think a pelvic binder can be absolutely uh, life-saving, and there are really not a lot of downsides uh, to it. So for for you guys who who are out there looking for other ways to improve your trauma care, particularly in vulnerable populations, especially those that fall, uh, like our older patients, then pelvic binders are a phenomenal adjunct to to trauma care. Uh, I'm going to answer that uh, question. And so we have about um, three minutes, three minutes left. Um, I'm going to just uh, reiterate a couple of lessons uh, that we learned from, from this case. And um, the outcome for this patient was uh, pretty, pretty favorable. After massive transfusion uh, protocol and after source control, we, we know that um, replenishing this volume, replenishing the coagulation factors and the oxygenation capability of packed red blood cells is absolutely life-saving. And so in EMS, we should consider bringing that degree of care and reperfusion uh, in the field. So just watch how much, uh, how much love from blood products this patient uh, received. Um, fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, packed red blood cells, uh, et cetera. He uh, did not wind up needing a surgical uh, procedure to evacuate that hematoma in the in the um, in the thorax. I think this could have been absolutely catastrophic and lethal if he had been on anticoagulants because it's very tough to get source control of a mediastinal hematoma, and especially you put an older patient like this through that kind of surgery, they may not uh, do very well. So he's very very fortunate that that hematoma got better on its own. He got pinned. He got um, basically is the equivalent of a traction splint, but with surgical pins down in the emergency department. And we wind up having to put what are called rainy clips on his scalp. They're basically kind of fancy plastic cl clips that allows the scalp to basically kind of tighten up on its own and, and stop um, hemorrhage. So you can see with some basic maneuvers, some blood products, we actually give, gave this patient a much uh, better prognosis. I want to thank uh, Dr. Box. I want to thank uh, Dr. Paul Rosenberger. I want to thank uh, Mr. Kenny Navarro. I want to thank career Sir and Danielle for all of their um, kind attention. You all did phenomenally. I'm going to answer one last question in the chat. And guys, drop us an email. Let us know. Let us know how we how we did. Yeah, and if I could just add, if if you got a, if you have a question that you didn't get a chance to to put into the chat, then uh, contact Career Cert, and they can forward those on to one of us, and we'll be happy to get back in touch with you. It might not be immediately, but we'll be somebody will be back in touch. I mean, we don't have anything else to do but quarantine. So, <laughs> oh, I know you guys all have plenty to do. So, um, yeah, modern day superheroes right here. They're 
they're doing great work. But I wanted to give a big thank you to our presenters, Maria, Kenny, Gail, Paul, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this important conversation. We'd love to continue the conversation with you. So please log on to careercert.com. You can view this webinar at a later date. Other free resources are there as well. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for your sacrifices to make our communities safer places. Everyone take care. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Bye-bye.